Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for watching this webinar. So today we will be discussing clinical governance and audit, especially as it relates to the chemical pathology laboratory. So audits are part of a continuous quality improvement, and they are one of the key elements of clinical governance. And laboratory-based clinical audits deal with the everyday aspects of lab services. They are a means of providing feedback to the clients of the laboratory and the staff. And it also involves measuring the performance of the laboratory service against benchmarks or standards. And those standards have been established using principles of evidence-based medicine. So in terms of the overall process of audit, you conduct the audit and then the findings are made. And then if you need to make any changes, you implement them. And then you obviously have to do a re-audit after a certain period of time to ensure that the changes that you've, uh, that you've implemented uh, are maintained and they're having the, the desirable effect. And this is a, a cyclical process. And so you can audit different areas of the laboratory, and this could be the pre-analytical, the analytical and post-analytical phases. So if you choose to do an audit, you should always consider uh, the laboratory in, in those, in terms of those three traditional areas that we all, always uh, look at laboratory services. So quality indicators are very important in conducting an audit because they give you an indication of, of um, various operational parameters. And whether it's a laboratory or hospital, all healthcare organizations, delivery organizations will use various quality indicators to measure the efficacy of specific interventions and identify healthcare improvement opportunities, and as well as performance and outcome measurements. And these are the means to measure and monitor and improve the quality of care and services. Now, the laboratory plays a critical role in medical decision making. And so we do know that uh, laboratory data, the um, information that's convi conveyed in the laboratory data influences 70% of medical diagnoses. And in audit, is a process of evaluating and critically analyzing a pathology service. So doing a systematic and critical analysis. And it's, it's a quality improvement process really. And it's, it's a very essential part of a, a quality assurance program of a laboratory. So part of a, ver a continuous quality improvement process. Now, in terms of the laboratory audit, you can look at five distinct activities um, under the broad umbrella. So you can look at solving problems that are associated with a process or an outcome. So in delivering a laboratory result, whether it's a sodium or a glucose, you can monitor the workload in context of, the of, of trying to control the demand. So you can look at how many tests you're doing. You can look at new tests, if you introduce a new test, you can look at the effectiveness of the new test in changing practice. You can also look to see whether people are adhering to best practice, especially with guidelines. And you can also monitor analytical quality. So is your lab producing the best quality results that it can, can possibly deliver? Now, we also need to discuss clinical governance. And so there's a very close relationship between clinical governance and audit. And in fact, clinical audit is a key element of clinical governance, as we will see. And basically, clinical governance is a, is a system or a process whereby healthcare delivery organizations are accountable for continuously improving the quality of services. So you can see, we said that audit is part of a continuous quality improvement. And this is where how audit would play a critical role in clinical governance. So we need to look at a number of aspects of clinical governance. 
Firstly, what, what is the definition of clinical governance? We've briefly mentioned that. Uh, we need to look at the, the, the traditional seven pillars of clinical governance, and then need to look at the role of you as a laboratorian in supporting clinical governance, and really what is driving clinical governance. We also need to look at the so-called RAID model of clinical governance and the steps that it involves, and how do, you, how do these steps uh, interrelate to each other. So clinical governance, as we briefly alluded to, it's a system where healthcare organizations are accountable for continuously improving the quality of services. So it's a continuous process, or if you want to think about it in, in terms of corporate governance, it's a corporate accountability for clinical performance. So very, very important responsibility of the management of a healthcare delivery organization, be it a hospital or a laboratory. So the term was first uh, described in, uh, by the Department of Health in 1998, and it's very similar to the definitions we've already considered. It's basically a framework uh, through which, or a system through which healthcare organizations are accountable for continuous improvement of quality and safeguarding high standards of care. Uh, by creating an environment in which excellence in clinical care will flourish. And that was the uh, original uh, definition. So the other variations, we talked about corporate accountability. Uh, it's also important to note that the quality of service provided to patients is not just confined to the doctor's clinical activity. Now, as pathologists, as chemical pathologists, you can't avoid responsibility for the use of resources or other aspects of patient care that can impact on the quality of care or the service uh, provided. And so you as a pathologist, you have a duty and, and a role to play in clinical governance, and you have a duty to highlight any inadequate resources um, that may be present. So coming specifically to clinical audit, we said it's a quality improvement process. It's seeking to improve patient care because ultimately that's the goal, yeah, uh, improving patient care. And it looks at a systematic review of the care against explicit criteria. So those are the benchmarks and the standards. And you have to implement changes to address any uh, shortcomings that are identified by the audit. So you implement change. Clinical, with clinical governance, there has to be clear lines of accountability within hospitals or laboratories. And there has to be a comprehensive program of quality improvement systems, including clinical audit. And this has to support and apply evidence-based practice, implement clinical standards, workforce planning and development has to be taken into account. There should be clear policies at uh, managing risk. So risk management is an important part of this. Uh, one needs to identify and correct poor professional performance. And there needs to be monitoring of clinical care, which is integrated into the quality assurance program. Now I mentioned the seven uh, pillars of clinical governance. So these seven pillars are basically uh, clinical effectiveness, uh, continuing uh, professional development, so in, uh, continuing professional education, clinical risk management, uh, departmental organization or laboratory organization, for example, investigative protocols for various scenarios, service quality and uh, communication. So you can see how all of these will inter uh, relate to each other. You can, in, in, in terms of this diagram here, you can see uh, client uh, experience is also uh, an important aspect. We can, this uh, essentially summarizes the same concepts slightly differently. So you have education and training, clinical audit, staff management, clinical effectiveness, Data, manage, data and information management, risk management, and then service user and patient involvement. So you can see how all of these things are interlinked and part of this 
whole concept of, of clinical governance. So we showed them as pillars, but you can also show them as cogs in, a, in, a, in, a, in the wheel of clinical governance. And so the relationship between clinical audit and clinical governance, uh, clinical governance has uh, the responsibility of delivering the duty of quality. And so basically it looks at uh, so how well a laboratory is doing, looking at the service quality, clinical quality, investigative protocols, CPD, departmental organization and clinical risk management. So all of those things that we mentioned as, as the cogs or the pillars of clinical governance. So within clinical governance, an audit process should also address the patient user viewpoint of the laboratory, how critical incidents are dealt with and the perceived quality of help and advice to other doctors, so, so the doctors who actually use the laboratory. So clinical governance, it's not something new. It applies to the laboratory and we'll see how it applies to the laboratory. And the question is, how does it differ from corporate governance? So corporate governance, we said, uh, it relates to corporate governance in the sense that uh, there's a corporate accountability for the quality of the service that's being delivered either by the hospital or uh, by the laboratory. So very similar responsibilities that you may find in a company. So the, the concepts, the overall concepts are very uh, similar. And one of the challenges of clinical governance is that it, it, it needs to bring about the ability to produce effective change such that high quality care can be achieved and can be continued to be delivered. So change is always at the heart of clinical governance. And if you remember the words of, of Mark Twain, if you want to improve things or if you change things, you have to do things differently. And if you always do things the same way, you will always get uh, the same results. So we talked about the key areas of clinical governance, those pillars of COGS, patients, clinical effectiveness, risk management, resource effectiveness, and learning effectiveness. Now, the rate model of clinical governance basically is a model where you, um, you, you firstly start off by reviewing a system, uh, looking at where you are now. You gather information, you gather information from clients and staff, and you, you, you do audits, and that's where the audit process will come in. Uh, you agree on a plan of action and you make recommendations and you then put them into action, so implement them. So in that, in that aspect, in the implementation phase, you may encounter resistance and you need to deal with that, especially if you bring about changes. And then at the D, at the D stage, you're basically going to document uh, the effects, document the implementation, document the impacts of the implementation, identify any lessons you may have learned and then plan um, for the next step. So it's again, also a, a cyclical process and a continuous process. Now, if we come specifically to clinical audit, so it's, it has a, 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 an interesting history. So firstly, in the UK, we had the white work paper working for patients, which was intended to standardize clinical audit as part of professional healthcare. And this specified that time should be allocated for audit work within each hospital con consultant's job. And then in 1997, uh, medical audit was introduced as part of the 1997 white paper health reforms uh, in the NHS in the UK. And then in 1997, the Royal College of Pathologists published guidelines entitled Clinical Auditing Pathology. And these, and the Royal College of Pathologists also established the Professional Standards Unit to provide guidance to pathologists to produce evidence on the quality of service they provide. And in 2005, uh, specifically for clinical biochemistry, uh, 
the Royal College of Pathologists published a code of practice for clinical biochemists and clinical biochemistry services where clinical biochemists were required to conduct or participate in clinical audits to assess the quality of the services that they were providing. So the uh, process of uh, audit is also uh, can also be called benchmarking. And in the US, this is the term that's typically used. So it's a process of measuring product services and practices against leaders in the field and allowing the identification of best practices that can best practices that can lead to sustained and improved performance. So that's a transatlantic um, definition of a very, very similar concept as audit. Now, the whole process of determining what standards or criterias, uh, criteria need to be followed uh, relies on evidence-based medicine, or, and in this case, evidence-based laboratory medicine. So evidence-based medicine is, is, is at the heart of continuous quality improvement, and then audits are very much a part of this continuous process to create and uh, implement and maintain the best practice in the laboratory. So all of these rely on steps where you, 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 uh, you, you have a problem, you get information, um, you look at the information, you praise the information, you change your practice, and then you apply to the practice, you apply the, the change, implement the change, and then come back and look at it again. So on the left side, we've got commissioning uh, to look at a, 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 to analyze a problem. On the right-hand side, we have an audit where we're looking at performance management of a laboratory. So in some ways, uh, the important question arises about whether audit is research or whether research is audit, et cetera. Um, so the, the relationship between these are as follows. Uh, so research creates new knowledge and provides foundations uh, for national or local agreement about the kind of clinical care and treatment that should be provided. And audit will, for example, determine whether the laboratory is following best practice or agreed practice. Research is usually based on a hypothesis and an audit is measuring against uh, particular criteria or standards. And research uh, produces new knowledge uh, to, and increases and improves overall knowledge and discovers the, the best way of doing things. Whereas an audit looks at what you're doing currently and compares it to what is accepted as uh, best practice. So how do you go about conducting an audit? So you need to have a structured program with a team, with a leadership, and the team has to work closely together and you have to have uh, participation of uh, as many people as possible from the laboratory. And it's a cyclical process. So you will have, uh, uh, you will audit, you will set your standards, you'll measure your current practice, you'll compare the results against the standards, you'll then look at how it's worked out and then come back and, and do the re-audit again. So very much a, a continuous uh, cyclical process. Um, you, uh, you have to plan first and then you do the audit and then you, you action the changes that you, you activate the changes that you want to implement. And then you'll come back again and, and re-examine. Uh, so uh, that's the inner, if you look at the inner part of the, of the, of the circle, the outer part, you select the topic, agree the standards of best practice, define the methods that you're gonna to use to take, take, carry out the audit, you gather the data, you look at the data and analyze it, you make a conclusion and then make recommendations and you bring about those changes and then you come back and you re-audit again. And in, in a bit more detail, you can see all the steps here. So if we go to the top, uh, you, you um, look at uh, what you're trying to achieve. You get your evidence, you look at your evidence and your outcomes. You do your sampling, uh, 
which is your data collection. And then you look at why you're not achieving your goals so that your data collection will give you an idea. You bring about changes and you look to see whether those changes are producing the desired changes in the standards. And if you if if it's if everything is working, you'll have a, a, a quality improvement. And then you go and monitor the system again and then compare it again. So benchmark again, compare it against standards. And if necessary, you may also have patient and public involvement in the process. Um, uh, usually that would pertain to the hospital, whereas in, in a laboratory, um, uh, sometimes you may have patients that interact directly with the laboratory. For example, outpatients uh, may do so. So the importance of the audit is that it has a number of effects on laboratory services. It can help to modify laboratory and clinical practice. It, uh, it can look at the clinical effectiveness of the laboratory tests and on the clinical outcome. It can look at clinical care, um, effectiveness of clinical care. It can look at the effectiveness of quality assurance programs and also look at the effect on test usage. Now, in order to ensure a successful audit, you need to have an audit committee uh, that's in charge of all the clinical audits. And the committee should have a clear strategy with specified programs and associated, uh, associated activities. They need to have a support group. You may require funding for this um, if, if necessary. And they need to meet regularly. And they need to have criteria to follow that's based on evidence-based uh, laboratory medicine principles. And they need to show that once you've completed the audit, you've implemented uh, plans um, that uh, were recommended by the audit. So again, a very uh, similar concept is shown here where you measure baseline, set your standards, measure practice, compare against the standards, look for areas of improvement, make changes and look to see how, whether the changes have had any impact. So coming to the actual audit itself, we said you need to have a structured program, you need to have effective leadership, it needs to be teamwork, there needs to be funding available, you need to allow time for people uh, to conduct this. Sometimes if you're having an audit done, some institutions require that this should be officially registered because it's, it's a process that may uncover deficiencies in other departments and so you may it's it's it, some institutions have rules that require you to actually register the audit if you are conducting an audit so this again basically summarizes all the essential steps and that you may want to do to to undertake the audit so there are six stages of the audit so stage one to six so Firstly, or you can think of them as five stages, but I've added, uh, I've made it six stages here. So five is, the first one is preparation. Second one is, is looking at uh, the criteria and standards. Thirdly is the data uh, gathering. Fourth stage is analysis. The fifth stage is re-auditing. And the sixth stage is the report. So you need to have a formal report, which is why I made it six stages. Um, although some people may I uh, think of it in, in, in five uh, stages. So in terms of what to audit in the laboratory, we said you can go pre-analytical, analytical, post-analytical, post those traditional areas that we divide the laboratory into. And so if we look at pre-analytical, you can go, you can audit the request forms to look at whether they, the forms are fit for purpose. Do they ask for relevant information? Are you getting correct specimens? Is phlebotomy functioning as it should? Is, is the transport via lab transport functioning effectively? Analytical, obviously many more areas that you can look at. Uh, are you doing the appropriate tests? Um, are the tests being carried out according to correct SOPs? Is, is, is lab safety adequate? Are you using your staff efficiently? Um, is purchasing and procurement functioning effectively? Are your laboratory reports uh, clear as they should be? Are you, what is your stock control like? Are you storing your reagents and specimens properly? Uh, 
is your internal quality and external quality uh, assurance programs functioning effectively? Are the tests being utilized appropriately? Uh, do you need to implement some demand management strategies? Post analytical, you can look at turnaround times, see what turnaround times you're achieving. Are you achieving your targets? Are, are, how are you reporting results? Is it direct? Is it by a computer? Is it printouts? What reference ranges are you using? Are the correct are the reports being interpreted properly and appropriately? Are you dealing properly with complaints? Are you taking corrective actions against any in 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 when any critical incidents occur? So, if you're uh, so the audit's important because it can affect uh, or, or have an impact on the lab uh, services markedly. So it'll affect the clinical care. Uh, quality assurance programs and test usage. So if you have high quality guidelines, this will help clinicians to order tests more efficiently. And so you reduce the laboratory expenditure or the hospital expenditure. And with quality assurance programs, you can uh, determine whether the quality assurance program is actually working well for you, it's functioning well for you. And then test utilization you can look to see if there's unnecessary testing and whether you need to implement some form of demand management. So in order to ensure a successful audit, you need to have some clear approaches. So you need that audit committee that we talked about. You need to have a clear strategy. You need to have a support group. You may need funding and you need to meet uh, regularly and you need to involve all the staff. So as we've come to the end, I would like to summarize what we've, we've discussed. So uh, improvement of health services needs the objective measurement of people, practices, and organizations against uh, valid standards and criteria in order to create uh, or implement change. And in terms of good clinical governance, laboratory-based clinical audits are a very essential part of, of total quality management. And they are useful in developing guidelines for testing and assessing test usage in various aspects of quality assurance programs. We said audits are a part of a continuous quality improvement in the laboratory and one of the key elements of clinical governance. An audit will compare current practice against the standard that has been set and, and will look to see whether this practice meets the standard. It's a cyclical process. It measures performance. It makes suggestions for improvements. And also, because it's cyclical, you have to go back and re-audit after a suitable time period. And there are plenty of areas that one can find in the laboratory to audit from the pre-analytical to the post-analytical phase.